So guys, you wanted to know about disinternments. And so today I'm going to be sharing a few of my stories of disinterments that I have found most uh, interesting and amazing. And I'm also going to be doing an interview with a gentleman named Chuck who disinterred and reinterred his dad very hands-on. So I'm going to start just by talking about disinternment and exhumation, which the words get interchanged often. However, exhumation actually is the unearthing of a body. And that's it for what that word means. Disinterment is actually where you exhume a body and are unburying them and then you go and reinter them in another grave space. So crossover, they seem to be about the same word, but the exhumation is almost more of a verb where it's just that act of bringing the body up, where disinterment is the whole act of unearthing the body, removing them from the grave and then moving them. So let's hear a couple stories about some of the most fascinating disinternments and reinternments that I've been involved in. All right, so let me dive into my stories about disinternments. So the first disinternment I ever was a part of, um, I learned a lot from it because uh, I learned that you can't always trust maybe someone's memory of an event that happened years and years ago and that you should always be prepared. So headed out to do a disinterment of a child and uh, the family had said kind of told me what the baby had been buried in. So I did not involve a vault company because typically when babies or children are buried they're in a combo unit which means the casket and vault is one unit that the exterior of it is hard enough to act as a vault um, so I thought okay I can just you know pick this child up put it in the back of my van drive it over to drive him or her over to the new cemetery well little did I know I got there and the sexton was there and they had exhumed this large concrete mass I have never seen anything like it and so for me to pick it up and put it in my van and move it, I mean it was 300 pounds, it was crazy. I, I've never seen anything like it. I don't know what kind of vault it was. Um, I couldn't see even where it could open. We couldn't figure it out but um, we did eventually get the baby up into the van and moved over to the other cemetery but I learned a lot from that incident because you just don't know what you're going to find every time you do this. Um, and I think that's what I love about disinterments is you kind of learn along the way and um, you learn how to do the paperwork and so there's permits that you have to get from the public health department that they sign off on a disinterment actually getting to take place. And the permit looks like a burial permit um, that you use in the beginning. It's a little uh, yellow permit, um, at least here in Michigan it is, and so there's a big form they have. The family has to fill out, and all of the next of kin that have legal rights to say if that person can be moved have to sign. And so whether that's the living parents of the person that has died, of the child, whether it's brothers and sisters, children, grandchildren. Whoever is that immediate next of kin all have to sign off on that person being moved. And then on the new grave space, if it's being used from a family grave space, everybody has to agree that that's where they're going to be buried. So there's a lot of agreement that needs to happen um, for that the actions to all um, land into place, I guess you would say. So my second um, story I will share had a gentleman and he had been buried in a national cemetery which um, the no-cost grave lining vault that is provided as a basic vault it does not seal and so um, often you know moisture is an issue if you ever have to do um, a disinterment and so we ran into that in this case so the woman wanted her husband um, brought up and we were going to then ship him to another state where she was moving to. She wanted him buried out there um, where she was going to be because she planned on 
being there for her final days and then being buried out there because that was where her family was. So we were essentially bringing him up and then flying him out there for a new burial. So when we brought him up, um, we opened the vault and he had had a wooden casket and we had figured we might run into problems and we did. The wooden casket was cracked and falling apart because of the moisture um, from being buried. It had been about three years. And so as you can see with the pictures, there's a lot of cracking, a lot of mold, a lot of mildew, a lot of decay. And so what we had to do was bring that casket back to the funeral home, move the gentleman into a new casket, and then from there we sent him out to another state. And um, he was reburied out there in a new cemetery. We did then have to take that old casket and had to dispose of it, and you can't just throw it away, so we had to cremate it at a crematory. So in this instance, there was a lot of cost involved, almost as much as a first burial, because there was the disinternment, there was the permits, um, overseeing of the disinternment, the vault company, disposing of the vault, um, the disposition of the casket, and then the purchase of the new casket and the new vault and the airline. So there was a lot of cost involved this time, almost as much as that first time um, that she had buried him. But it was really important to her and that in the end is what matters, is comfort and what is important to the family. And so um, we made it happen for her. And it was a really cool experience to see him after three years. Um, I had been working there when we buried him, so getting to see him after a few years and just seeing um, where he was in the stage of um, kind of decomposition and the mold and the mildew and just I guess what happens when someone's buried and everybody um, decomposes differently and you may unearth two bodies that were buried at the same time in the same cemetery and they may look completely different, uh, but it was really interesting. I guess cool isn't the right word. I don't want to offend anybody by saying that, but it was really fascinating to get to see that. So that's one reason I do like to do disinterments is because you can see so much of what happens after the fact, after we bury someone, after our job is done. Um, so that was really, really fascinating. My third story I'll share um, was one of the most interesting days I've probably had working as a funeral director. I think just because of my interest in forensic anthropology, I loved this day. So a family had come to me and they wanted to bury, or they wanted to move a baby that had been buried about 60 years ago. And at the time, there was minimal vaults being used, and you know, we knew the baby was probably buried in a cloth casket. So, we knew going in, we were probably going to not run into um, a concrete, not concrete literally, but into a hard, uh, rigid container when we went down. We were going to have to go very slowly, very carefully, because we were probably going to just run into cloth and bones and, and such. Um, but this family was very adamant they wanted this baby moved over to where the other family was buried. Now some families that call with this request and you explain to them what you might run into, they choose to just leave the baby where it is because they don't want to disrupt and, and leave bones here, bones there, because you may not find all the bones if you're doing something like that. Um, and it just might turn into a situation they don't want to have happened, so they leave the baby at peace where it is. In this situation, um, the family did want this baby moved. Another uh, unique thing about the situation was when the baby had been buried, um, the baby's sister was young and wanted to plant a tree in memory of the baby. Most people don't think of this. When you plant a tree next to a grave, as that tree grows, those roots grow into and push into the casket, into the vault, into things that are there and can disturb and breach the casket and can potentially breach a vault if it's a non-sealing vault if the vine or if the roots grow correctly. So in this situation we ran into just such. This now, you know, 50 to 60 year bigger tree was now completely grown into this grave space. 
So the grave, um, the grave diggers and I worked. I was in jeans and I was down in the hole and the family was there and they were so appreciative of what, what was going on um, and that we were putting forth this effort. And we finally ran into the space where the baby was and it was a long process of slowly digging. We would find a lot of fabric that was wrapped around bones so we were able to find groupings of bones. And I had brought a new casket with and so as we were finding bones we were laying them out in the new casket in the best order we could so that you know I don't know what all the bones are especially in a baby it's hard to know if this is a a leg bone or an arm bone or you know what these bones are but we did the best we could laying this this little baby out and so it was really interesting from the forensic anthropology interested side of me to do this and to be able to give the family what they wanted so it was it was such a fascinating day and it was so cool and I was you know the the grave diggers and I whenever we see each other we talk about this still however many years later and I ran into the family years later and we still talk about it and what a unique situation it was and um, so it was it was really cool I you know it's I think with the disinterments reinterments it's a little bit more of a facilitating um, of, of an event rather than you know the emotion and everything there I'm sure that there are many people that get caught up in the emotion of doing those um, type of movements and um, especially if it's for you know I'm sure a crime case or, or something where the person has to be uh, disinterred for um, you know another autopsy or something of that nature but when they're just moving out of um, necessity or facilitating that then it's more of a function and um, not as much emotion but it is really it's really fascinating um, I'm sure I'm gonna offend somebody by saying that it's fascinating but it is to me and I'm sure it is to many people too which is why I get a lot of requests for this topic on videos so um, and by all means if you have more questions about disinterments you know they're um, they're all different and they all cost different um, you know ranges that it can be just a couple hundred dollars depending what you want to do or it can be thousands of dollars depending what you want to do and a lot of it is the unknown because you don't know always what someone was buried in back when they were buried. Um, you can pull up old records from 50 years ago and it just might say wood casket or metal casket but we don't know if it was a ceiling casket or a non-ceiling casket and even a ceiling casket if there's enough water in the hole and in the grave can breach and you know rust through on the the welded um, creases and such so um, there's a lot of variables that you just don't know what you're getting into um, doing disinterments but next we're going to talk to um, a gentleman who actually did a very hands-on disinterment with his dad. Hey guys, so I am here with my new friend Chuck and we're talking about disinterments and reinterments today. And Chuck had actually shared a story on YouTube um, with me and, and with everybody that had viewed. And so when I knew I was going to be doing this video, um, I asked if he would share a story and he happened to be traveling in my area about three weeks later so we set this up which is pretty amazing that we were able to do this so his story is really unique because it's so hands-on when it came to disinterment and reinterment of his dad uh, when I first moved to Arkansas when I was a teenager it was quite a culture shock things were much different in Arkansas than in Michigan and um, one of the things I loved was that people still did things the old-fashioned way that we was totally foreign to me uh, while people were going to mortuary or funeral homes more and more regularly sometimes they still took care of their own dead you know the mm -hmm. the friends would get the men would dig the grave and build the casket the women would wash and dress the body and I always wanted to be part of that you know historic cultural yeah when my father died in August of 1995, and two, two years later, my mother asked me 
to make arrangements to move him where he was buried in Oklahoma, back near home in Arkansas. Well, when he died, I suggested to her that he have she have him buried closer to home at the, or at least cremated, so that she'd have the option, you know, moving him later if she if she wanted, but she wouldn't do it. But <clears throat> when she requested that he be moved, she said she wanted to do it so that he could be reinterred the same day he died in Oklahoma. Okay. And so did she move down then to Arkansas, <clears throat> where he was being moved to? Well, they both lived in, <clears throat> in Arkansas. They okay. both lived in Arkansas, yes, and that's where I grew up. And he found a job in Oklahoma, and okay. that's why he was there when he died. Okay. And so he was buried in the National Cemetery up in Oklahoma. Correct. And so that actually made it, I think, a little bit easier when it came for time to, to move him. Um, a little less costs and a little bit easier to set things up just because of that. So your mom wanted him moved, and she kind of gave, put it upon <coughs> you to educate yourself to get this done. She told me just to handle it, and she'd, she'd write the checks. When I did the research, uh, the f I asked a funeral director locally um, about it, and he said it would cost thousands and thousands of dollars to do the job. But when I continued to ask for details, he began to take me seriously and told me that I'd have to make arrangements with a local funeral director and the director who had him buried in the first place. And <clears throat> so I just had a point of contact locally, and he worked with the uh, Oklahoma funeral director, and everybody at the National Cemetery were perfect. They took care of the, they handled it like it was something they did every day. Um, your mom tasked you with getting your dad moved. Correct. And so you had talked to the funeral directors and kind of found out your first steps, and once they realized how serious, then things kind of got into motion. Right. And you started laying out a timeline almost, and getting dates and getting <clears throat> permits and, and things set. Well, the funeral directors took care of the permits. Communicated with one another more than I had to. Um, I had to make arrangements with the local director, of course, and call the director of Oklahoma. And I gave, gave them the points of contact. And the fellow in Oklahoma made all the arrangements for the health certificates and, and uh, arranged with the National Cemetery. And then <clears throat> they just told me when to be there. And I showed up in a pickup truck. And I arrived in the morning, and they had just opened the grave. We're in the process of hoisting the casket out. Well, when you were getting ready for this, I remember because Chuck had written up, written up this whole story of how this took place and kind of his steps along the way and, and shared it with a group online, um, kind of like Find a Grave right. is now. And one of the things was, you know, deciding between modes of transportation and costs. Right. And when you looked at the weight of the vaulted casket um, and having to rent probably a truck, it actually was less expensive to remove his casket from the vault and just transport his casket in your own pickup truck. Correct, and then buy a vault. And then buy a vault on the receiving end right. cemetery at the cemetery. So that's what you ended up doing. Um, so they discarded the vault at the National Cemetery. Um, I'm sure they so you got there at the cemetery, and kind of tell me what happened when you got to the National Cemetery, because you were there when they brought your dad up. Right, I, um, <clears throat> they were, had just in the process of beginning to lift him out. I looked into the grave and his casket was floating in several inches of water, which surprised me. Yeah. <clears throat> and then when they hoisted the casket out, it was streaming out water and I could hear water sloshing around inside. I thought they were waterproof, but I guess not. Yeah. And um, they set it, set it down, and then several of us lifted the casket up and set it in the back of the truck. <coughs> the, uh, the men there provided a, um, a box to put over the casket so it wouldn't be too obvious. That was nice. Obvious. Yeah. 
But this was August, and it was Oklahoma, and it is hot in August. And at first, it was no big deal, but as the day got hotter, I could smell something really awful. <laughs> yeah. Now, what would you compare that smell to, do you think? Um, very ripe cheese. Okay. That's, I think it's a very hard smell to correlate to something just because it is so unique, but it is strong. Well, not only that, even after we had him reinterred, I still had the smell in my nostrils for days afterwards. Yeah, it sticks. That's, um, decomposition is uh, fat molecules, and so they stick mm -hmm. um, to things, and so it's hard to get rid of that smell after, after a while. So then they loaded him, basically placed him in your vehicle. Correct. In this box, and off you took. Well, they also gave me his headstone. Perfect. Okay. And then it was six or eight hours to home. Okay. And then when I got home, I offloaded him onto some kitchen chairs okay. because the casket was very co covered with mold and mildew, and I wanted to get it cleaned up. And um, then I reported to my mother that I'd moved, you know, he was in my backyard. Yeah. <laughs> Keep her and, updated. <laughs> and he, she said that it was going to be a couple of days before we buried him and I should move him to the refrigeration facilities at the funeral home. So I called the funeral home. And that's when I learned that funeral homes don't have refrigeration. Not all of them. Yep. And they said, all things considered, it would be probably be better just to leave him where he was because I don't think that the, they wanted him in town. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you, so you cleaned him up. You cleaned up the casket. Correct. And So what did you use to, what were? Just normal cleaning compounds, 409, yeah. whatever. Yeah, just scrubbed it down. Mm -hmm. It cleaned up pretty good. I'll, it, it, the pictures. It did clean up. There was, there was a few blisters in the paint and whatever, but... It looked fairly decent, much better than it did when it came out of the ground. Yeah. So then a couple days went by. Right. And you had your time to go be at the cemetery for his burial. And so you went out to the cemetery, and the hole was not dug yet. No. So tell me I about think it was that. the next day that the, um, I had informed the funeral director we were ready for the burial. The next day he sent out a backhoe, and I was there for that. <clears throat> I did want to dig the first symbolic shovel full of earth, so I got as what I could do and then had the backhoe come in. The first site they decide, uh, picked to dig the grave, they dug down a foot or two and hit uh, rock, a slab of rock. So they picked another place and hit another slab. Finally, the third place they found suitable for a grave. Okay. And. Um, then we had the grave and it was ready, and then the day after that was the day we were supposed to bury him. And uh, the folks with the vault showed up in the morning. They were very nice. They asked if it was okay if they drove into the cemetery. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just didn't assume that. They could, yeah. And so they pulled in and um, set up the vault. And it was putting a casket in a vault was much different than I thought. I thought that you put it into the vault. No, they lower the vault, then raise it up over the casket. I mm -hmm. didn't know that. It was, it, was, it was a learning experience for me. Yeah. And your mom was there, and your sister. Well, they showed up after, after all this was done, and then we had a brief ceremony. Okay. But uh, they weren't there before. Well, my sister brought my mother okay. for the reinterment, but they weren't involved in... They weren't involved in um, any of the moving or the preparations or the phone calls. Yeah, all the legwork. Right. They got to see the final moment. Right. And they were at the cemetery, oh, 10 or 15 minutes, and then they left, and then I helped finish with filling in the grave. So I, at least I got to partake yeah. in that, that part of it. And then you came back the next day and placed his headstone, too. Correct. It was quite heavy, and 
Yeah. And I, I still go back. The, the cemetery is in a very rural location, and, and there hasn't been any, anybody buried there since he was, and that's been over 20 years. Wow. But I go back and check on it, and I mow it a couple of times each summer. And, okay. And I make sure his grave is okay. And you know, I kind of just take, took it on myself to take care of the cemetery. How large is the cemetery? Two acres. Okay. So not too big, but no. decent. <clears throat> but it's very old, <clears throat> and many of the stones are just field stone that's set in the earth with no identification. It's typical rural Arkansas cemetery. Yeah. It's a couple, 150 years old maybe. What I loved about the story when, you, when I was reading it that you had sent was that that first hole you dug and you hit that rock, they said, well, we can try another one, or you could get dynamite. Right. So but, you could pay for the dynamite upgrade right. at the cemetery <laughs> to get in that hole. <clears throat> they said dynamite would cost another $500. And I said, no, <laughs> we'll just find another spot. <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay, now, originally the funeral director had told you thousands upon thousands of dollars right. to do this. So when it came down to it, even though this was back in 1997, what were your approximate costs from beginning to end? Well, I think the uh, Oklahoma Funeral Home charged $200. The National Cemetery did not charge anything to open the grave. Um, the new vault cost $750. And the Arkansas Funeral Home charged $100 to, to um, oh, handle their end yeah. and to dig the grave. So, so. under... About a thousand dollars. Yeah, about a thousand plus gas money. Yeah. Wear and tear on the truck. <laughs> right. It, it took me two days to make the trip. Yeah. Was there anything you learned doing the process that you would give advice to somebody else about it <coughs> to maybe make any step easier or encourage with it? Well, the only advice I could give is, is they, when they buy a casket, if they want it to be waterproof and all that other, they should spend the money to get it done. Uh, to me, it's not that important because it's all going to be part of the earth eventually anyhow. Right. Um, I was just surprised that it, that it did leak so much water. It was, there's a lot of water in it. Yeah. Well, because the vault wasn't sealed, it allowed all that water in and that rusted through or ate through probably the joists in the, the joints in the vault. When I arranged to buy the vault in Arkansas, they told me that there was an asphalt sealed around the lid. <clears throat> I did not know what my mother would have which her next request would be. So I asked them to re keep the asphalt seal off in case I had to open it again. <laughs> Just in case she wanted you to yeah. do one more move. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past her, but no, she, had, she didn't ask that. So now when you did the reinterment, did you have any kind of a little ceremony or did anybody say any words or? It was just um, the immediate family or a few of us and we, it wasn't religious or anything, just, you know, a few minutes of re you know, remembrance. Had a moment. Right. Was it more emotional than you thought it might be, or? It wasn't emotional at all. I mean, we'd, no. all, we'd already gone through that at his original okay. funeral. This was more, more technical than, than emotional. It was okay. pretty straightforward. Okay. I've, I've talked to some people who find that it is... It's almost like doing a reburial, and it brings up all the emotions again. And um, I wonder if the hands-on approach, though, maybe you know, does something for you with that, though. Well, the primary emotion I had was the immense satisfaction in being involved in actually burying my father, which I did not have at his original funeral. The funeral director took took care of everything. Yeah. I was just in attendance at the funeral, and that's all. 
but this was actually a satisfying experience in be, being able to bury a family member. Yeah. It, it's indescribable. So hope you liked all of the stories that we shared about disinternments and would love to hear if you have one to share with us, um, please post it below. I love hearing these stories, especially if you've been hands-on with doing the disinternment, if you've opened the casket after doing it to check out what the person looked like. And I've heard several stories about that as well. Um, love hearing them. So send them on over and share them with me. And I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.